a follower and learner and pupil of Christ, we have to battle with these things. We have to wrestle with these things. We have to do spiritual warfare on these areas. Okay? There is no sin-free zone. Even as a believer. You're either being tempted, tested, tried. You're either resisting, fleeing, abstaining, or submitting. But you always deal with these hindrances. And if you don't deal with them biblically, they will hinder you in your spiritual growth and spiritual development. And so if you're guilty of drifting, if you're guilty of a hard heart, if you're guilty of dullness of hearing, and you're trying to apply Bible truth, you are fighting a losing battle. You cannot drift away from Christ and drift away from his word and fight out in the middle of the ocean when you're supposed to be tied to the harbor. You cannot have a hard heart and expect to be changed. Amen. When God says, and you know, Ezekiel says, and Jeremiah says, God's going to take your hard heart and give you a what? Heart of, flesh. heart of flesh. And there are people who are hard, hardened in their heart, against the word of God and against God. Because God didn't do A, B, C, or D. Okay. And people, there are people who are just dull. And I'll, have, I'll give you a number of words for what dull or dullness means because uh, I went to all my resources to come up with words to help you understand. And, and, and you see this all the time. I see it all the time in people's lives. So let's talk about the hindrances and inner struggles that can affect spiritual growth. And we all have inner struggles, amen? Amen. amen. Are the people not having inner struggles are people who are dying? <laughs> and they have a whole different set of struggles on the other side if they're not Christians, okay? The problem there is a constant war between our sin-infected flesh and the Spirit of God that now lives in us. You guys have heard me explain this before. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Somebody read chapter 6, 1 through 5, 1 through 6 for us, please. Of Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer to it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be <coughs> slaves of sin. Okay. That old fallen you. Mm -hmm. That old Adamic and Eve you, if I can put it that way, has been stripped of any legitimate authority in your life any longer if you are a believer. But now the problem is not that old fallen because that's been replaced with a new you mm -hmm. the spirit of God you mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit but now that new you has been, been placed in 
an old human fleshly body that still hasn't been transformed or glorified yet. So think of it this way. You're going to get a new body the minute you are raptured into heaven. Right? Why is it that this body can't go to heaven with you? Because it's still corrupt. But the new you, when you die, goes into the presence of Christ. Because it's no longer corrupt. So the new you, the glorified you, the new you, the Holy Spirit, the new man, is placed in a body that's still corrupt. That still likes sin, that still remembers the taste of sin, that still remembers the feeling of sin, and still likes the feelings of sin, and still wants and lusts after sin. But the new you doesn't want any of that. And these two are at war constantly. Because your flesh still lives in a world that feeds your flesh. Nothing in this world feeds the new you. Only the word of God and a heavenly mindset feeds the new you. So everything in this world is in opposition to the new you. And everything in heaven is opposition to the fleshly you. And you got to choose who you're going to present your members to. Everybody get this? Let's read again, Romans chapter 6. Somebody read verse 7 through 14. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Wait, but stop now. What does the Bible say? It says, for he who has died has been freed from sin. So that's true whether you feel like it's true or not. <laughs> okay. That he is not talking about Christ. That he is not talking about the Holy Spirit. That he is not talking about God. How do we know that he is not talking about them? Because it's smile. Because it's not capitalized. Right. So that he is talking about the people in verse 1 through 6. Mm -hmm. But you got to know this. See, key word. Verse 6, knowing this. See, if you don't know this with the intention of living this, mm -hmm then you'll never experience it as your reality. See, you got to know this not just intellectually. You got to know this by experience. Starts intellectually, but now it's got to become what? Your experience. So that you really know it, and it's not just something that's in your head. I die. The old you has been stripped of any legitimate, your main problem, Christ has fixed. Sin. Yes. So that comes as we know that truth, hold on to that truth, are obedient to that truth, and that's when we overcome those things and then it becomes that experience. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wait. So keep on, oh, I'm sorry. And, 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 and I died when I accepted Christ. Right. The old you died. Right. You still live. Yeah. The new me. The flesh part. Not the stone. Right? Correct. Okay. Okay. Come on. Let's but go. this, these members, they ain't dead yet. They ain't new yet. Right, but I, I got to watch who, what I. Don't, don't run too far off that. You, you, you're on the right path. Submit. No, you're on the right path, but let's, okay. let's work through the, the scriptures. All right? Okay. Keep reading. Okay. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. <coughs> Death no longer has dominion over him. Stop. So he's giving you an illustration. Yeah. Okay. Your, your old man no longer has any legitimate authority over you. And sin no longer has any authority of you. And the comparison is he takes death mm -hmm. and uses the illustration. Since death no longer has any authority over Christ, 
sin no longer has any authority over you. Keep reading. Okay. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Yep. The capital. Mm -hmm. Okay. Likewise. So now, now, that gets you in verse 10. Yes. Okay. Get verse 10 down now. Mm -hmm. For the death that he died, mm -hmm. he died to sin once for all. So he has paid the penalty of sin for all. Yes. Who believe? There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. No. That's why there's no condemnation for us. Okay. Because he has paid the penalty. Amen. Okay. He has satisfied God's wrath against our sin. Okay. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So, you used to live for flesh. Right. You used to live for sin. <clears throat> sin used to be your master. Right. But since sin has been overcome by the death of Christ, yes. you now shift to a new master. Just sin is no longer your master, but Christ. Okay? Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, there's a transition that happens. A shift. There's a shift that happens. Yeah. Okay. A transformation. It would be the proper word. Amen. Okay. Right, let's fix See, the problem is that many people think Christianity is is something that you got some stuff added on to you, uh, mm -hmm. or some stuff subtracted from you. No, it's transformation. Amen. And that's why people are so messed up because they think they just added something on. But if you added something on, whatever you had before what you added on, you it's that. still there. Mm -hmm. But in transformation, it's radically changed. Amen. There's a difference. Everybody with me? Yes. Okay. But you got to know this. Yeah. You got to know this so you live this no matter what your flesh and the members of your flesh Sorry. try to tell you. Yes, sir. Go ahead, it says verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're dead to what? Sin. sin. But we're alive to what? Alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay. So what were you before Christ? Dead to God, dead to God and alive to sin. Mm -hmm. So you can't be what you were before. before. But we keep talking like we still what we were before. Because you don't know what you're supposed to know. Amen. Or you wouldn't be talking like that. Yeah. We were dead to God, but alive to sin. But now that we're in Christ, and Christ is in us, we're dead to sin and alive to God. That's transformation. That's not something that was added on. Everybody got it? Yes. Okay. Keep reading. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For <clears throat> sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, so you're not you're not under the law of sin anymore. You are not under the grace of God. And Titus chapter two, verse eleven says, "Grace ought to be teaching you some things to deny ungodly and unrighteous, but to live soberly and righteously in this present age." Your problem is not how well you're going to live when the new age comes. Your problem is how you're going to live the new. The now. Yes, sir. I'm going to live like where I'm going. Now. Amen. That's our problem. Yeah. Nobody's going to struggle in heaven with sin. No. <clears throat> there will be no sin and no struggle with sin when you're glorified. Thank you, Jesus. The struggle is now. Now. 
but who are you going to present yourself to? Why are we presenting ourselves, and this is all about habitual consistency, nobody does it perfectly, but why are we habitually consistently presenting ourselves to something we're supposed to be dead to and not presenting ourselves to what we're alive to? Because you didn't do that in the old life. You didn't present yourself to God when you were dead to God. But you presented yourself to what you were alive to, sin. So how do you get over here and now present yourself to something that you're dead to and not the one you're alive to? Because you don't know what you should know. You might know it intellectually. But if it doesn't move from your head and your heart to your feet, mm -hmm. you don't really know it. It's got to become your experience. Okay. Some things you only know by experience. And the Christian life is more than just intellectualism. It's experiencing the new life as your reality. Everybody with me? And you can read the rest of the chapter, but I think you get the point of it. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 14 to 25, which comes after it, talks about that inner struggle. Paul talks about that inner struggle and that battle between doing what he knew God wanted done and, 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 and not doing. And his battle would have been with Judaism. Mm -hmm. You understand? He's a Pharisee. See, we take that and make it something that it really doesn't mean. Because Paul thought the law was it. But the law that he was obeying on the outside wasn't matching up with what's going on on the inside. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Remember Jesus said about the Pharisees, the cup looks clean on the outside, but it's filthy on the inside. Paul yes. said, that was me. Yes. I used to think my performance was really what I was, but I had a problem inside that my performance couldn't deal with. Amen. Okay. And we as Christians sometimes get in that mentality. You know? And sometimes we as preachers have to be careful about rules, 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 rules. Because if you haven't been changed anyway, you can't obey the rules. In a way that really gives God the glory Amen. rather than giving you the glory because of your self-righteousness mm -hmm. rather than having his credited righteousness. Because your self-righteousness will always fail the standard of God. Amen. Amen. The law was meant to show you you need Jesus. Because yeah. <laughs> nobody can keep it perfectly. That's why Jesus had to come and do it for us. And take our sin and then take his righteousness and have it credited to our life, 2 Corinthians 5 21. Okay. So people are wearing themselves out trying to do it themselves, pull themselves by their own bootstraps and all this other stuff. Okay. God has really taken the load off of you by giving you Christ's righteousness. Because your righteousness and my righteousness will never meet the standard. Right. And so now the Christian life becomes about appreciation and gratitude, Amen. not about I have to, I have to, I have to. It, it, it comes now out of thanksgiving and appreciation and gratitude. Mm -hmm. And that changes the whole thing because when you have to, you know how it is, when you have to, I got to do it, I got to do it, I'm trying to do it, that'll wear you out. But when you do something because you just can't help it because you're so grateful, it's so appreciative, so thankful, it's not so grinding on you all the time. Yes, it's very free. Okay. Yes, sin and carnality are still present with all believers. There's a remnant. Uh, you know, I use the illustration on, on, on Romans chapter 6 when it says that uh, sin no longer has any dominion. 
The old Roman Empire used to be a very powerful empire. And you go around and see the buildings, you can see the, the Senate and the council gathering, and Caesars gathering together, and you would see the power of that nation. Well, that nation no longer exists, but you can still go over Rome and see buildings and see what it used to look like when it rained because you have remnants that tell you about the rain. Your old man, your old nature no longer rules or reigns, but there are still remnants in you. Okay. And they still like talking to your members. They still like trying to influence your members. And you have Satan on the outside. You got demons on the outside. You got this world system. So we have enemies. Uh, Romans 7 21 talks about this. This is because our flesh has been trained to sin. And some of us trained it better than us. See, some of us didn't live out our depravity on the level that other people lived it out. While we're all totally depraved, we all didn't live it out equally. Some of you were protected by God. Some of you was too scared to do stuff. Some of you had moms and daddy to beat it out of you. <laughs> yeah. We're all told to pray, but we all didn't live it out. As perfectly as we could. And that's, you know, that's what I tell people. Well, ain't nobody perfect. Well, you didn't even sin perfectly, but you did enough we know you were sinner. So now just live Christian enough we know you're a Christian. Because <laughs> you didn't do all the sins you could have done. So you didn't sin perfectly. That perfect thing never had worked with me. Go try that on somebody else. That's just an excuse. Amen. Okay. We must constantly remind ourselves that we are dead to sin. You must constantly, constantly, constantly remind yourself that's what knowing means. You got to constantly consider this. When sin starts whispering in your ear, you got to tell it, "I'm dead to you. I don't have I don't have any responsibility for listening to you or responding to you. You don't own anything here anymore. I'm under new management, new ownership. I have a new master." You used to be my master. You're not my master. I'm dead to you now. You have to meditate on that and you have to talk to yourself like that. So that sin doesn't become a habit in your life. Okay? But you're always going to be battling. Victory today don't mean a victory tomorrow. <laughs> you can have a victory one minute from now, but two minutes from now, there's no guarantee. If you're not constantly, consistently doing that. Okay? Okay, that's normal. That's normal. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If you ever get away from that practice, you will end up drifting. Oh, no. We, no, no. And then you'll fall and find yourself going those other things. Yeah. 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 So that we do not follow its lust. It is, this is why the process to discipleship is to deny ourselves. Be committed to the word no matter the cost. This is why you must constantly be nourishing yourself on the Word of God. Constantly nourish yourself on the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It keeps you. Okay. That's why it's good to hang around other people who are striving the same way you're striving with the same intensity you're striving with. Matter of fact, get with someone who's more intense. Amen. Okay. They're, they're, you know, just like in sports, there are certain guys who raise the level of everybody else's mm -hmm. ability. Mm -hmm. You got to find some disciples that raise your level. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't want it to be hard and you don't want them to be nice and sometimes they talk to you like you ain't human, then you're not striving for perfection. Mm -hmm. There's a reason everybody wants to play with Tom Brady. He'll win him. He's going to come to work, except for now lately. <laughs> but normally, when he was focused on football, 
He's first one in the door, the last one out the door. You're not going to outwork him. You're not going to outstudy him. And that raised the, hey, I want to play with somebody like that. Yeah, I don't want to be with somebody just collecting a check. <laughs> I want to win Super Bowls. But see, we don't want to win Super Bowls in our Christian life. We want to be blessed and highly favored. We don't want to win Super Bowls. We want to be hidden not to tell. But we don't want to be like Christ. And that really should be the aim, the target. The Bible says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You have to die to yourself. You have to die to yourself, deny yourself, dedicate yourself. All those things we talk about in our discipleship definition. And, it, and it's, it's work. Amen. Especially work in a world that tells you you should have everything you want the way you want. Mm -hmm. That you are the most important person in your life and in this world. Now, if everybody's important, nobody's important. Mm -hmm. But we're telling everybody they're equally important. They're not mm -hmm. equally important. They're just not. Now, everybody should be equally respected for being created in the image of God, but everybody's not equally important. Everybody's not equally gifted or talented. Everybody in your house wasn't equally gifted and talented. There were some people in your house that were <laughs> smart, and there were some people in your house that were not so smart. There were some people in your house that were good athletes, and there were some people in your house that were not so good athletes. So why do we expect equality with all the masses and you don't even have equality in your own house? And dare I say, everybody's not going to be equal in heaven. So God's not even about equality when it comes to roles or, 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 or your, your place in the kingdom. There, there's some criteria as how you get that. But everybody will be equally Born again, everybody will be equally glorified. Everybody will be. There are some distinctions in life. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant also be. So, wherever the master is, that's where the servant is supposed to be. Whatever the master is doing, that's what the servant is supposed to be doing with the master. How are we following Christ doing stuff he wouldn't even be doing? And never did. If he says I must be about my father's business, and we're adopted children with equal inheritance rights, we don't have to be about the father's business. But that's the way far too many people think. And they wonder why they're not growing. They wonder why they have no interest in reading their Bible. Because you're not on the same agenda. The will of the Father is not your first thought. Even John the Baptist understood that, right? He must... I, he must, I must decrease so he can what? Increase. <clears throat> John said, I can't compete with him. But we have a lot of people that are trying to compete. Doesn't work. We must not be controlled by sin. And that's the issue, controlled by it. Controlled by it. Dominated by it. There is not a Christian outside of Jesus Christ that has not committed sin after they got saved. But they're not to be controlled by it. 
See, if you confess and repent, you're restored. Amen. Right? Yes. First John 1 John 1.9, right? Mm -hmm. So you got off track. You got out of line. You transgressed. You crossed the line. You were disobedient. But you confess and repent. And God says, now you're restored back. So now you're not what? Being controlled and you don't have a habitual path of disobedience, transgression, trespasses, all the words for sin in the Bible. When you confess and repent, you're no longer habitual. But if you sin and you don't confess and repent, it's habitual. Yes, I'm sorry. But really the only control sin can have of us is what we give it. Because as a believer, sin no longer has control over us. Yeah. Right. Sin does not have to control the believer. Sin always controls the unbeliever. Mm -hmm. Always. But it should not always be controlling the believer because you're not what you used to be. We must not be controlled by sin, however. We must be slaves to righteousness. This is Romans 6, 15 to 18. Let's go there again. We can read that portion. I think it's important. Somebody read for us verses 16 through 18. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Verse, in verse 18. Okay, I'm sorry. But God be thanked that through you were slaves of sin. I'm sorry, it's underlined. Yet obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Okay. You were what? Slaves of what? Slaves. But when you were set free, you became slaves to? Righteousness. Just like you habitually used to sin, now you habitually live righteously. Because you have been what? Transformed. Delivered. Saved. Born again. Deal with the Holy Ghost. Okay. So when you don't have that, the, when the, that would be unbelief. That's some of the unbelief that you're talking about in last week, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because if you grieve and quench the Spirit, mm -hmm. and if the Spirit is the main, if I can put this right, source for your living, then you can't live. Like you're supposed to live because only spirit can produce that life in you. None of us can live the Christian life, even though you're born again, without the Holy Spirit empowering you, enabling you, and equipping you, and controlling you. It's impossible. It's not enough just to be born again. You got to be filled. You got to be controlled by the spirit. That's how Christ lives his life in you once you have his life in you. But if you grieve and quench the spirit, then that enabling, equipping, and empowering doesn't happen. It's not enough to be indwelt with the spirit. You've got to be being filled, constantly filled. That's Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine, but that dissipation. But be what? Feel controlled. So now we can live like we were born again to live. And it's possible because of this next verse. No one who was born of God practices sin without repentance, without grief, without conviction. Mm -hmm. 
Because, why? His seed abides in him. This is what Peter tells us in Peter, 1 Peter, right? Amen. You were not born again by corruptible seed, but incorruptible. Now, how does an incorruptible seed produce corruptibleness as fruit on the tree? See, this is why this is not brain surgery, it's Bible surgery. Amen. I'm saying, okay, you're saying that the seed of incorruptibleness has been planted in your soul. Yes. So all I need to do is give it a little time and see what comes out on the tree. And if corruptibleness eventually comes out on the tree, I know the seed ain't incorruptible. I don't care what you tell me. Because the seed determines the fruit. If I said I plant an apple seed and we wait however many months it takes for an apple tree to come up and it's oranges on the tree, don't let me sit there and try to convince you that's an apple seed in the ground. Don't be that foolish. Because the seed can only produce the fruit that the seed is designed to produce. So how do we have all these Christians all over the world, all over America, producing all this corruptedness, talking about they got an incorruptible seed. Mm -hmm. Vote for stuff that is corruptible and not voting on things that are incorruptible. How is it? How do we have all these people who have the incorruptible seed in them going to listen to all this corruptible preaching and teaching? That don't, nature don't work that way. That, I mean, that's the point of the illustration. Nature don't work that way. And we're talking about what is characteristic, what is regularly being produced in our life, because none of us do it perfectly. But because we don't do it perfectly, that's not an excuse for us not striving for perfection. Did I get that? Any questions on that? And that's why we need each other. Amen. You need some models of your life that are living this thing out. Amen. So you can see, hey, it's possible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's possible. Well, nobody's living in the Christian life the way it's supposed to live. First of all, you don't know everybody. That's it. <laughs> and all you can really say is that you're not living it. Because there are people who are living it, and we got a whole hall of fame of faith in Hebrews that says some people did. Amen. As well as the whole body. Mm -hmm. That's why you got to stop taking illustrations that are pre Pentecost and use them for post Pentecost people. Because mm -hmm. Peter was a scaredy cat, denied Christ, went back to his old job. And that never happens again after Pentecost. Now, in fact, he's the first one to step up. Y'all do whatever y'all gonna do. But we must proclaim and preach in this name. And the only difference is Jesus is on the inside of them instead of being on the outside of them. It's the only difference. Pentecost makes a big difference. Because Jesus, in the person of the Holy Spirit, takes up residence in people so that we cannot live the life, not by our ability, but by his ability. Amen. And when you get off track, let me tell you, if you ain't got something knocking, something jabbing at you, say, hey, 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 this, this is not you, this is not what... Come see me. We will lead you to the cross. Because <laughs> that's supposed to happen. Now you can grieve it. You can quench it. But it should be happening. You can't just sin the way you used to sin. You just can't. It's not comfortable anymore. It's just... And there's a difference between feeling guilty about it and being convicted about it. I feel guilty about a lot of stuff I never change. 
When you're convicted, you gotta make a change. Yeah. And conviction has to do with more with sin. We feel guilty about a lot of stuff, but not really sin. I wish I would spend more time with my kids when they were younger. You, you, you feel guilty about that, yeah. but that wasn't necessarily sinful. Understood. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people go in depression and, 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 and disillusion and discombobulated because they feel guilty about stuff. And the Bible says don't do that. I mean, I got anxiety, I'm stressed out, and the only solution is stop it. Wait a minute, Pastor, you got something more than just stop it? No, the Bible says don't be anxious. Stop it. If you are being anxious, don't be anxious. But what about the five steps? I ain't five steps, just one. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Replace worry and anxiety with thanksgiving and prayer. Yes. Well, come on, man. These other people got 10 steps and a twist and a twirl. <laughs> if you like Barnum and Bailey, go ahead and go over there and watch it. It's just a circus. It's not in life. <laughs> practicing sin means obeying. Uh, practicing sin means obeying the desires of the flesh. James 1, 14 and 15. Jane takes you through the whole progression of how sin comes about. It just doesn't sneak up on you. It just doesn't happen. There is a process. There are steps. Okay. Anybody need to go there? Okay. Trust me, I know what it is. We must practice righteousness through the obedience of the word. You only practice righteousness when you're doing what the word says. So we have Christ and other believers as a model of righteousness, and we have the word that leads us and instructs us on righteousness. And then we have other believers who are striving in that direction who are examples of righteousness even today. Okay. So all the excuses are gone. All you can really say is, I'm really not interested. I'm really not committed. I'm not willing to deny myself. I'm not willing to die to myself. And I'm not willing to dedicate myself. And I will tell you what Jesus told you. Then you cannot be my disciple. Wow. <clears throat> we must learn to hate sin. Do you hate sin? I hate sin in a way that I didn't when I was first got started in this journey. When I first got started, I didn't understand that. But as you mature, you get to understand it. Because you see all the devastation. Yeah. You see how much it hurts God. You see how much it hurts others. You see. And all the world's got is medicines and pills and entertainment or this or that. no real solutions to what is really the source of many people's problems. The source of many people's problems. Uh, well, this will help to develop a low tolerance for sin. And that's what you want to do. You want to get less and less and less tolerance for sin in your life. And maintain a good relationship with God for the following reasons. Sin grieves the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're not concerned about the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be greedy because you grieve the Holy Spirit. But do you really want to make God sad? Do you really want to hurt God's heart? Because that's what we do when we grieve the Spirit. <clears throat> It's poking me. Hey. 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 Can I get a word? Can I get a word? <laughs> okay. 
and you throw water on it. You tell it to leave you alone. Hey, you know you haven't read your Bible today. You know you, know you haven't read, you know, you know you've been in the Word today. You, you, know, you know you haven't prayed today. And so you turn on TV so you don't hear it anymore. <laughs> Or you distract yourself with something else so you don't sense it anymore. Or we lie to ourselves. There's a number of ways we grieve the spirit. Dishonors God, sin dishonors God. And if we're living for the glory of God, then why would we do things that dishonor God? We're all guilty. Amen. Amen. Keeps our prayers from being answered. First Peter 3.12 addresses men, but it's true for all of us. Causes good things from God to be withheld. I'm tired of hope. Listen, listen, listen. What would it be like to get to heaven mm -hmm. and see all the things that God wanted to give you that you didn't get because you wouldn't give her the same? <laughs> Pastor, that ain't heaven. We just gonna have a good time in heaven. Seeing I'm gonna be glorified, everything. No, no, no. Okay. Go read your Bible again. Says he's gonna have to wipe away some tears. Some people are not gonna get a crown. Some people are not gonna be invited to some special occasions. This is all in your Bible. To be in heaven and see what you could have got that you didn't get, get, and you're perfect. So everything you feel now, you feel perfectly. Now, fortunately, God gonna—he gonna lift you up. He gonna clean you up. He gonna yeah. there, there, you know. But you gonna feel it. You are gonna see it. You are gonna sense it. Yeah. Robs us of the joy of our, and we we miss out on things on earth. Not just in heaven, we miss out on a lot of things on earth Amen. that God wanted to do for us, and wanted to give us, and wanted to provide for us. That he couldn't because sin robs you of those things. Robs us of the joy of our salvation. David experienced this, right? The man after God's own heart. Because of his sin and not dealing with his sin, he did not really enjoy the deliverance and relationship he had with God. Inhibit spiritual growth. First Corinthians 3 1. Sin inhibits your growth. It does. Truly. That's why some people are growing like gangbusters and some people yeah. still in diapers. <clears throat> Hampers. <clears throat> Sin inhibits. Brings chastisement from the Lord. Uh, we don't like that, right? I do not like getting spankings from the Lord. I do not. I figured something out growing up in my family's house. If they got a spanking for it, I wouldn't do it. Because <laughs> I didn't like spanking. I did not like going to get my own switch. And I definitely didn't like going to the drawer and getting the electric Extension cords. So very rarely did I get spanked for the same thing again. But I also learned, well, if they got spanked for that, guess what? I ain't doing that one. Let me go outside and play. Something else I learned. And it's true spiritually. Don't get too close when other people are getting spanked. Because <laughs> you might get it. 
Because my mother might, you did something. Come on over here. You did something. I don't know about it, but you did something. And sometimes we suffer because of the people we hang around. They're getting chastised. We're hanging around them, and we get chastised too. Just because we have a family affiliation, we have a brother or sister affiliation, or a working affiliation, sometimes. We saw that with Jonah, right? Right? Jonah's the problem, but other people in the storm. Right. And I've watched it. Sometimes they they won't throw Jonah off the boat. Because it's their child, it's their son, it's their daughter, it's this, this, it's their dad. And life is falling apart and ship is falling apart and cranky and you won't get rid of Jonah. Then that person leaves or you decide to leave and go somewhere. Oh, life just, look at the sunshine now. <laughs> so look at this. You could have had that the whole time. Now you need to have discernment. But sometimes we get caught up in other people's discipline mm -hmm. from God. Prevent us from being fit vessels for the Lord to use. 2 Timothy 2 21. Sometimes it keeps, sin will keep you from being a fit vessel to be used by God. There's so much more that many of us could be doing for the Lord that if we wouldn't let sin run our lives. Mm -hmm. You can get so much more use out of it. You have to figure that out. Pollutes Christian fellowship. The one another's. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is not people don't like you. <laughs> the problem is you got sin in your life that's hindering the fellowship. Yes, it is. And God has a problem with you, so you can't experience the, the communion with his other kids because daddy's got a problem with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes, sir. Big brother's got a problem with you. The Holy Spirit's got a problem with you. But you blame the other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it hinders our Christian fellowship. It, it really does. Ouch. Amen. It endangers our physical life and health. God has taken people out of this world because they would not deal with their sin. From a human perspective, it looks like an early death. From God's perspective, it's a death right on time. See, this is why I don't get caught up in, why are so many young people die? Here it is. Disobedience can end your life early, the Bible says. And we're running around here, thumbing our nose and <clears throat> spitting on God and using his name and profaning his name and God just supposed to let us go on and not nothing happens. Disobeying our parents, rebelling. And we think nothing's supposed to happen. When you really should be on your knees thanking God that you're still alive knowing that you've been guilty of rebellion. Amen. But sinners will not do that. <laughs> and sometimes God's people will not do that. God's focus is not only to redeem us, but to also purify us so that we become a holy nation. Titus 2, 12, 14, <clears throat> Romans 8, 30. We are a holy nation. See, God calls his people, the church, really, is what he thought, a holy nation. God don't claim no other nation outside of Israel or the church. So stop trying to make America Christian. And all this Christian nationalism. God doesn't claim any other country. We must remember that God saved us to begin a work in us for his purposes. Philippians 2.13 God just didn't save you so you go to heaven. God wants to do a work in you to conform you to the image of his son. And that's not just living right. That's living the right way. Mm -hmm. And being about the right things. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
So many of us are busy with so many things that have nothing to do with the agenda and kingdom of God. Let me mess with you for a minute. And then close. Even your job should not be taken until you figure out how having that job is going to glorify God. You shouldn't even choose a school as a college student until you figure out how choosing that school is going to glorify God. See, I've, I've learned this over time. And, and that's why I can speak with experience on this. I used to do a lot of things that, not a lot of things, I'm sorry. I used to let baseball keep me from doing kingdom stuff. That was my idol. That was, but I thought. God gave me this ability. God gave me this talent. There's a lot of people who want to be professional baseball players. You have the ability to do it. That's a difference. And so I thought doing that, but it was keeping me from the things the Bible says are the agenda. This is just hoping this is the agenda. You're thinking this is the agenda. You know? And, and when God got my attention, I had to leave all that stuff behind. I had to leave it behind. And got busy about kingdom stuff. You know, the church we were going to, um, <clears throat> uh, after, you know, when I was ending all that, uh, once I put that away, I became the busiest person in the church. We used to have business, and the congregation, why his name on everything? What you elders doing? I was doing this, and I was doing that, and I was doing this, and I was doing that. Because I know what commitment he wanted, because I know what commitment I used to give to the eye. But you hear what I'm saying? And so everything began to change in our, in our life. And God became the main priority. You know, my whole thing was, you know, why everybody is serious about God got to be up in the pulpit? How come home can't be in the pews? Because first thing when you get serious and you really work for, maybe God calling you to preach. <laughs> <laughs> and my thing is, why is everybody who's serious about God got to be up in the pulpit? How come we can't have some serious people in the pews? Amen. So I fought that for a long time. Because I, I, why we got to be up there to be serious? How come I just can't be a faithful worker out here? Of course, God came along and said, I'm preparing you for this. Mm -hmm. But the, in my mentality, people in the pews need to be just as committed as the people up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a radical change. <clears throat> and that's a person who grew up in church. But did God really have full commitment? When I talk about this stuff, I know what I'm talking about. I've been there, done that. Made most of the mistakes. But I know when God really gets your heart, it radically changes you. But he can't really, there are people that might be saved, but if you're not getting truth, you are hindered. Very much so. See, it took God getting me truth, Dr. Evans, when I began to listen to him on the radio, when I own my business and I begin to listen to him and, and, and it, began, it began to click with me, this is what's been missing in my life. That stuff they were doing in church I grew up in, if that was it, I'd never be a pastor. I'd never be a teacher. But when I began to hear Dr. Evans and, and the word of God began to get, get a hold and I just began to eat everything that he was preaching and read every book, you can't grow if you're not being fed. So there are people who are legitimately saved, mm -hmm. but not being fed, and their growth is being stunted. So this is why I'm the way I am. This is why I do what I do. Because there are too many people like that who need to be delivered from that. Amen. And that's kind of been my mission. Amen. Thank you, Lord. 
that just gives you some insight of why I am the way I am, why I think the way I am, why I act the way I act. Uh, growing up in church, and I, I believe when I was 12 or 13, I, I made the commitment because it had to be a work God for me to go up front of all those people because that would never happen. <laughs> Unless God was doing something. Because I, I would never go up in front of all those people and say nothing. But I knew just enough. But did God have all of my life? That's a whole different question. And it's because you weren't properly getting fed. Because when you start to get fed, everything changed. Yeah. And stuff just started to have to go. Right? And so, you know, that's kind of why we do what we do and why we're wired the way we're wired. And, and that's my hope for all of you, that, that the light will go on because you're getting properly fed. Thank you. And we're willing to walk with you patiently and lovingly to help make disciples. And we got to become, I think our church is, is very committed to making disciples. One of the things we have to change is becoming multiplying disciples. And because that's the only way that I'm committed to church growth. I'm not willing to do all the other stuff. All right, any questions on that? We'll pick up here next week. <coughs>